feel like remind me, um, I wanted to do this straight from the top of my head, but I don't want to do this straight from my speaker, so I will rely on my phone for it. So, a seasoned advisor, Mr. Randall Avery, has over a decade of experience in both financing and accounting. Upon graduating from Georgia State with a bachelor's degree in finance and becoming a CFA candidate, candidate level three certified, Mr. Avery, his work has put him in contact with several prestigious agencies in Atlanta, such as many agencies, such as Turner Broadcasting, Georgia Pacific, Invesco, and Auto Trader, to name just a few. The owner and CEO of RSA Diesel Advisors, Mr. Amy demonstrates the passion he's had since he was just a child to not only help people with their financial advice, but to learn himself how to better pursue financial expertise. And in doing so, Mr. Avery deals with daily his clients and he aims to improve and preserve what financial criteria and financial capital they already possess. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Avery, our founder's brother, to speak to you today about the system. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce you say, my name is Randall Labor. I'm the founder and CEO of my own company called RSA Diesel Advisors. Just to give a little bit of background about myself, I graduated right down the street from Georgia State University with an undergraduate degree in finance and accounting. Today I want to talk to you about an important topic to me. Um, over my 10 years of work experience, it's something that bothered me something that I tried to figure out what was wrong with me and why was I not fulfilled with what I was doing, the effort that I was putting out, I was succeeding, I was making a lot of money, and I was really enjoying my life. But what was the problem? And today I want to talk to you about that, especially at the age each of you guys are in right now, because you guys are going to make a lot of decisions that are going to impact your life. So today I want to give you what the problem is as far as the structure that you're in, and also to give you a mental model to help improve and help improve the decisions that you're going to make. So first, as the program said, today we're going to talk about the system. And I'm going to briefly describe what the system is and why it exists. The system is a process in which individuals live unfulfilled lives due to the fact that we have been taught as individuals to pursue money, but have not been taught to preserve, grow, and invest our wealth to enhance our skills and our talents. We exert so much effort to gain wealth, we eventually realize that we are getting an inadequate return on our investment. We can't describe why we feel unsatisfied, um, but we turn to other vices to comfort ourselves. This affects the process and contaminates us like a cancer. The unfulfillment and confusion of why your vices are not fulfilling you negatively affects your viewpoint on life as a whole. It changes your viewpoint of relationships, redirects your values, and eventually changes your viewpoint to the fact that point that you cannot even recognize yourself. The system was developed by man with the help of what the economists call the invisible hand. Like most forces in life, too much of a good thing can be bad. The same can be true with the concept that we call capitalism. If someone was to program a model based on pure capitalism, they'll realize that it's an unsustainable model. The players in a capitalistic society without laws and boundaries will start to compete with each other, but not in a healthy way. Um, the players in capitalistic society without laws and boundaries uh, will, will, will try to work at a zero-sum game. This competition will result in only one winner, and, will, and they, they will have all the incentive in the world to constrict the factors of production, hurting the customer. The customer will eventually get fed up and causing the capitalistic companies to lobby and issue societal controls. And the customer will submit to the controls to a point into which they've had enough and they'll revolt against the capitalists. The customer will only have his body to fight back because the capitalist holds all the resources to resist the attack. The result is a bloody battle with many lives lost with no resolution. In short, a complete pure waste. I say all this because this battle is actually going on inside of you right now. The system is grinding its gears, destroying your life, and when you look at the end of it, you're going to say to yourself, what a pure waste. There's a conflict of income maximization to consume all the goods and services in your life, and that's considered the capitalist. 
And then there is another person, a person who wants to enjoy life and produce the type of fr fruit that your creator wanted you to produce, and that is the consumer. And there's a battle going inside you right now. Like I said, today I want to, get to explain why the system exists and also give you a tool to help you think through the problem. But before we go there, let's get some terminology together. Let's really understand how a financial planner looks at your life as far as the wealth life cycle. Now, if you thought of a wealth life cycle, you probably draw something similar to what I'm about to show you. But having a mental model from beginning to end will really help you get your mind around how we plan your finances. So first is time. Time is a very important factor. It tells you how long you have something, something to occur, how long you have something to manifest itself, and it actually tells you how many options that you actually have. And of course, since this is a wealth life cycle, on the y-axis there's going to be something called wealth. And hopefully wealth goes up, and usually the more wealth, the better you're off. The next line I'm going to show you on this graph is the most important line. It's a line that we're going to use throughout the whole lecture. So if you grasp this, I believe you'll grasp the whole concept. It's called human capital. Human capital is the embodiment of all your skills, talents, know-how, even how lucky you are. And it's that embodiment that you will exchange for a job, for services and goods to earn income for yourself. Over time, you're eventually either not going to want to work anymore or can't work anymore due to health issues, and you're eventually going to go into retirement. And that will be the end of your human capital. The next line is financial capital. While you're expending your human capital, hopefully you will be increasing your financial capital over time. So when you stop working and you retire, you will have enough money to sustain your life. Now there's a new phenomenon in America and the most developed economy is that the golden years are, living, are expanding longer than ever. Um, if you live to 60 and have good health, um, it's projected that you live all the way to the age 90. That means 30 years you will be not working. A third of your life, you're not working at all. So planning for those years is important. And making sure the quality of those years are, are good and as, as you want it is also important. But eventually, we all have to reach the end. And we take a trip to the upper room. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is what we do and pass on to the next generation. Whether it's a family member, whether it's the interest or our passions that you have, what you pass down in your legacy is important and something worth focusing on. So this is how an economist, a financial planner, actually looks at your life and plans it out. And I hope this helps you get your head around how you should proceed. At this point in your life, this is the highest point of human capital that you have. And over time, you're going to expend it. So let's make sure our financial capital is in place to take care of us when we retire for those 30 years. So now we're going back into the system. The question is, what have you really learned? What do you actually know at this point? Let's talk about school. School was a great idea. In the United States, in 1605, school began in the United States. It was a great place where you can learn about the three R's. Your reading, writing, and arithmetic. It was a way for you to supplement what your parents could not teach you into a centralized location. The problem is, over time, that school kind of became as a convenience for parents. And the question is, what were they really learning? When you graduated high school, what could you really do? Could you make money to sustain your family? Could you make money to actually do the things that you want to do? The question is, we've been teaching since 1605, but have they gotten any better? Have you done anything besides have to go into college to potentially, hopefully, gain more money? Now, I'm not going to give you just a problem. I'm going to give you something to compare it to, something that you can think towards. Back in the day, there used to be something called apprenticeship, which mostly boys in between the age of 15 and all the way down to 10 years old will go under a master worksman. And he will learn from that worksman his skill and trade. And after he has completed his years, around seven years, this boy was expected to own his own business. Now, there was no conflict between the boy and the master um, craftsman because the master craftsman was probably not going to live to age 40, unlike what I just showed you, people living to age 90. So passing down his skill and know-how was important. It was actually part of his legacy. So by default, when this, when this boy got past his years, he was going to own his own business, be able to provide for his family, have a skill and craft. Now compare that with what we do at school now, and even go as far as college. 
I graduated from Georgia State University with an accounting and finance degree. They never taught me how to do a single tax return, but I have an accounting degree. They did not prepare you to go into your own and make your own money. What they did was prepare you to work for major corporations. And trust me, major corporations have a big part to play with this. If you're going to grow a large company, guess what you're going to need? A lot of employees. And a lot of employees dedicated and focused on your mission and your goal. And how do you do that? You control what they value the most. And what are some key things in your life that you value? Your retirement. How you live at the end of those years. What that 30 year period, how people prepare those. So they plan for your 401ks, they plan for your pension plans. And those are all good, but what are they really saying? I control the way you live in your latter years. What's another piece that they really control is health care. Not until recently, since the Affordable Care Act, the only way you got decent health care was to go through a major corporation. They would rip you off if you went outside of that bubble. So if they control your health care, and if you had health care needs, those are conflicts. You have to work for a major corporation. They're actually going to control you. The next thing is entrepreneurship. A company will say, oh, we love competition. We love to go against the grain. We love these new ideas. But when it starts hitting their bottom line, when they actually start seeing things go against their way, they're going to prevent those things. That's why they have complicated patents. That's why they try to control a whole business ecosystem so it won't be as affected as much. So those how the corporations have something to do with it. Now the next thing I want you to think about is your consumption worth compared to investing. Like I said, over those 12 years in school and even in college, unless you're a finance major, you don't think about investments. You weren't given a mental model to think of how you're going to get an adequate return for your investment. So we as a society want things, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it becomes wrong when we purchase things that go against our value system. For example, there's a push right now to travel the world, and I understand the value of seeing things and having experiences, but when you don't have an emergency fund, and you're not invested in yourself, and you have not given to who and what you care about, you're actually selling yourself short. Our lifestyles are so full of stuff, it's hard to see what's valuable anymore. We don't know the difference between consumption and investment. But wait a minute. Why can't we make all of our purchases considered investments? So today I want to submit to you a new idea, an idea that I hope you will hold the rest of your life. There's no longer consumption in your life, but everything is either a good or bad investment. Let's make calculated bets than being dictated by the media and other interest groups on what we want to buy, what we desire, and what we actually value. So the next thing I'm going to show you or give you a mental model. So I described the system. Why you have that conflict in your system is because those interest groups are trying to control you. But now I'm going to train your mind to think of investments. Think of everything you buy, do, enjoy as an investment in your life and what you value. So the question is, how indifferent are you? Just like earlier the life cycle, I'm going to give you another graph. And this graph, I hope, I really do hope, that you hold on to your whole entire life. So the first thing on the x-axis axis is risk. What is risk? Risk is something that you give that you could lose. It means something that you forego and have a chance of never getting back. As you go a little bit further right on the x-axis, the more risk you take, the more you have of loss. And we're going to compare that on the y-axis with return. Return means you've given up something to get something more. And there's a positive correlation between risk and return in most cases. Usually, if you take more risk, you're probably going to receive more return. You've heard this a thousand times in your life. Now we're going to draw a new line that you have not seen before, and it's going to be a pretty important line. We're going to see this over and over again. It's called an indifference curve. The indifference curve is just like it sounds. You're indifferent on any point on this curve. Whether if it's low risk or high risk, this curve represents the optimal choices that you have pre-decided in your life that is acceptable for you to live forward. And there's different areas of above and below the indifference curve, and they all have different meanings. First, we're going to go with the area above the indifference curve. If you are in this area, this area is supposed to be unattainable, something that cannot exist. And if it does exist, you either need to redraw your indifference curve or make a decision and act upon those things. 
The area below the indifference curve are below the optimal set of decisions that you have to make. And those represent suboptimal decisions that you should not even consider. It should not even be worth your time. Look at the graph for a little while and really feel what it's saying to you. The indifference curve is the, is the optimal set of circumstances that you have predecided. So how indifferent are you depends on you. Everybody in indifference curve is not going to be the same. It's going to be different compared to your risk and return profile. How risky you are and how risky you, not, you are not. Okay? So let's look at different lines. Let's draw a line a little bit above the original indifference curve. What does this mean? This means this individual needs more return for every incremental amount of risk. All right? So this individual is not going to take as much risk, and he's not going to be able to have that much opportunity. The way that helps me learn finance is to give these different lines different characteristics and different personalities. So somebody who is low risk, let's give this a name. Um, in most movies, um, you'll see somebody um, and something surprise happens. So a lady will reach out and grab her pearls, okay? This person is surprised at everything and, and gets the jitterbugs and won't go out. They'll spend a lot of their time in their dorm room studying because everything else is just too risky for them. Now let's draw another line, a line right below the original curve. This individual takes a lot of risk, okay? Let's call this person Miss Risque, okay? This person is not surprised at anything and is willing to take more risk and is going to be open to a lot more opportunities. Now somebody right down the middle, somebody who's still surprised at things but still likes to take chances, we'll call that person Miss Wright. We're giving these different lines different personalities that help us understand. Now, I understand this is Emory. It's a liberal arts college. So we have to be fair. So let's do this from a, a guy's perspective, or put guys on this graph. So somebody who doesn't like to do too much, does not like to take risks, let's call this person, it's like watching paint dry. He doesn't do anything. He, he's boring. He doesn't take time. And if you are that person, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just we all have different personalities. The person who takes a lot of risk and takes a lot of chances, let's call this guy um, Mr. Big Daddy Fat Sex, okay? He has fun, he lives his life, he takes chances, um, and he's going to be able to do a lot more things because he can take more risk than somebody who's not. Now the person who's right down the middle is Mr. Wright. And, and as we know, <laughs> looking at that person, there's no question that he is Mr. Wright. I mean, I think it's pretty darn self-explanatory. So let's work with this indifference curve. We're going to put some of my um, things that I like to do on this indifference curve, and it won't be the same. Yours will not be the same as mine. Yours will be different. But this will be an illustration on how something like this will work. So what is something that is low risk and low return for me? That's read. Every time I read, I'm going to get something. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to grow from it. And it's very little risk. You know, hopefully the book doesn't fall on my head. But what's something that is a little bit more risky, um, but also gives me a little bit more return? Working out. You might say, why is that risky? Well, I can hurt myself. I can, you know, twist my arm or uh, a plate can fall on my head. Working out is risky, but the return is higher. Being able to fit into a suit, being able to go out, being able to attract a girl, those things are important to me. What is a little bit risky than that? Providing financial advice. You might, and, and I love doing it. I love doing it all day. I love to see the burden um, go away from my friends, family members, and clients. But there's risk to it. I've been taught to say there's no investments that's guaranteed. I have to be confident when I give advice to somebody, knowing that I'm taking into account their hard-earned money. And there's a high risk of that. But I love what I do because the return is so high. What's higher than that? Public speaking. Speaking to you guys is important to me. Being able to share an idea, a concept that you can use your entire life. But there's a risk of that. You guys can say, what is he talking about? What is he doing up there? Your beady little eyes are looking back at me. But I love what I do, and it's worth the risk. So the question is, what is the risk return profile for you? And everybody will be different. Let's quickly go through um, what doesn't fall in the line. Extreme sports, it might work for you. It doesn't work for me. Painting. I'm not going to be in the paint classes. It's just not worth my value. Singing in the shower, yes, but in public, probably not. So what are things that do not fall on your indifference curve, and what things that go on there? Let's quickly do food. Salad. You can't go wrong with a salad. Low list, world return. It's a no-brainer. You won't feel bad about it in the morning. Now, rice, if it's done right, it is delicious. 
and it's, it's really good stuff. Those people who eat red meat, a steak on the grill, it's borderline heaven. The riskiest thing that I eat, that I'm almost guilty to admit, is Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> um, I had some Sunday, and it was, it was so, it was amazing, it was fresh out the box. I don't know if you understand that feeling. <laughs> So we go from different things, from activities to food, and you can tell the risk and return trade-off. What I'm trying to teach you is how not to look at things as pure consumption, but take it from an investment mindset. What is the return of each activity that you do? What are some things I don't like? Milkshakes, you might like them, I'm not going there. Corn peas, you can have them, I don't even care about them, all right? So let's practically figure out um, how to use an indifference curve in a real life situation. Let's take debt. Everybody's familiar with that. So what are you going to do when you graduate from college? I did it, and be better than me, be different than me. Um, you're going to buy a car. Nice being done. I know this is every half y'all are happy and good. <laughs> you, might, you might not be able to relate to a uh, you know, poor George State student. Um, but when you buy a car, what do you feel? You feel great. It's a great feeling. It's amazing. But what happens, and you'll realize this as you pay that note that year after year, after year, after year. You're going to labor to pay that off. Now let's take this into account. So this is a financial decision. So first one we did activity, we did food. Now we're going to use our indifference curve for a pure financial analysis. All right? So let's throw it. CD. CD stands for certificate of deposit. It's something that you receive a bank for interest. Bonds are a little bit more risky than CDs. Um, they're, they're debt that companies issues. Um, stocks are a piece of ownership that you have in a company, and they're definitely more risky than any debt instrument or most debt instruments that are out there. So where does debt fit on this curve? When you pay a note on a car, it's a fixed payment. It's guaranteed. But it's going to be definitely higher than 4% in way, and sometimes higher than 5%. It's going to be up there. And what do we say when something hits that region? We say this should be impossible. And if it's but it exists in real life. So what does that mean? We either need to change our indifference curve or draw a different line. And the decision should be simple. Pay off your debt. No brain. Okay. What other ways can we do to beat the system? Invest in yourself. Like I said, what was the key vocabulary word that I gave at the beginning of the lecture? That was human capital. The embodiment of your skills, talents, know how lucky you are. Figure out ways to improve your human capital, what you like and love, your task in life, what you do for income. Figure out ways to increase that, and that will increase your financial capital. The next thing is preserve your health. This is Emory. I know you know about health. A lot of things that cause people to go bankrupt is not poor financial management. It's really health issues. If you go to the doctor and have a $100,000 procedure, that will quickly bankrupt you quicker than anything else. And I know health has a lot of genetic aspects to it, okay? But what you have, please try to preserve that. Never stop dreaming. When I worked for those various corporations, sometimes I went home and I thought about work, and, and, and I was thinking, how can I improve? But eventually, every time I went home and went to bed, I thought about, oh, how can I go up this corporate ladder? I literally stopped dreaming for myself, what I wanted, my value system, and I was completely focused on the company initiative. And you can tell how that churns in your system and why that is actually part of the system. The next thing I want you to do is give. Giving is important. First thing it does is forces you to live on less than you make. You might say, how is that a benefit? But think about it. If you make $100,000 a year and you give 20% of your income away, that means you're living on $80,000 a year. And let's say that job disappears. Well, you didn't necessarily lose a $100,000 job. You lost an $80,000 job. It's a natural hedge on different life's events. And living on $80,000 actually humbles you. The next thing, it puts your heart on the line. They say where your money is, where your treasure is, there so is your heart. So if you give to an organization or a cause, your heart is in that. You're vested in that. You're not just walking around aimlessly, just consuming things and making stuff that makes you happy. You're invested. The next thing, you make a bet on society. When you give food to the homeless, when you give to a cause, you're banking on something being solved. You're not just, like I said, aimlessly walking around life. So you are really giving back, and that's important. Now, this goes with consumption and giving. Always figure out who profits. 
Okay? Um, everybody knows about this if you give to a large organization that feeds the hungry. Only a small bit goes down. But let's think about this a little bit deeper. When you buy a, a suit, when you buy a car, who is profiting? How are they making those items? What type of labor practices are? What countries are they operating in? And does that agree with your value system? This puts a higher onus on a consumer. And it should be an onus on your investing habits as well. Your passions and interests. The question is, okay, you show me the line. How do I figure out what goes on the line? And how do I manage those things that go on our indifference curve? So first it is find out what you're passionate and interested in. But that's not enough. The worst thing for me is I meet an art student and they tell me, hey, I'm passionate about art. But they can't tell me a single thing about art. It, it bothers me. So the first thing I want you to do is seek knowledge. Learn about what your passion and interest is about. Really be a bookworm. Turn the pages. Nobody should know more than you. And if there's no more left to learn, invent something brand new. The next thing is learn to keep people within your passion and interest. Um, of course, mine, I work in finance, and like I said, you have to have a certain acumen, a certain moxie to work in my field because you're actually putting people's real money at risk. And it takes a mentality, and sometimes that's not always positive. So know the people that surround your interest. Next thing is know the laws and regulations because I promise you that your schools that you're going to won't let you learn that. They're just going to teach you enough to work for a large corporation, and they're just going to let a law department take care of that. After you do all those three things, you take time and you adjust your indifference curve. So at the beginning of this section, I just said, how are you going to beat the system? First thing you do, pay up all your debt. It's a no-brainer. I don't believe in good debt. Take care of that. The next thing, invest in yourself. Invest in your human capital. Invest in your health. Invest in who you are and can please continue to dream. Do not dream somebody else's dream for you, but dream what's in your heart. The next thing is give. Be invested in society. Don't aimlessly just consume because that's that churn of the system and that's what's really going to destroy you in the long run. And last thing, understand your passions and interests. And if you do all those things, you will be able to beat the system. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So you, you say you like pay off debt, that's no brainer. I got a good memory, sixty-four thousand. So how do you suppose like what's a good method of trying to pay off debt when you do have a large sum? Like do you kind of like take it piece by piece? Should you pay the smallest one off first or the larger one off first? Like how would you say going about that? Right, right. So first, when you manage your money, it's it's a lot of behavioral things too. So what I suggest is stack up some more chess money. That's probably about a month worth of living expenses. After that, you don't jab at the debt as the payment schedule. You throw haymakers. Everything you could do, try to get rid of that debt. Because what that does is, think about it. If you have a, a note or a debt, a student loan usually lasts for 10 years. Basically, a company knows they have you for those 10 years because they know you have to pay off that debt. Um, 65000 what is that, around $400 a month probably. Um, you have to work a certain level of job, which means you can't take a certain amount of risk. So make sure you have enough to handle your day-to-day -day operations as far as your expenses. That's about a month. That should be about two or three thousand dollars. But then put everything else toward paying off your debt. And at the end of it, you will be fulfilled. Now, there are certain exceptions. If you plan on working in the public sector, of course, they'd have a debt forgiveness process in which that you can stretch it out as far as possible and maybe you should do an interest only. But that depends. If you're in the $100,000 range, yeah, stretch it out as far and get the forgiveness. But 65, depending on your income, I personally would try to knock that out as soon as possible. All right? Any more questions? Yeah, okay. I was so forward it. But, um, OK, so you mentioned like investing yourself. To kind of go off of the question on paying off debts, would you kind of recommend investing in a CD or in a bond? Just Going, going based off of the return, would you be able to use some of the interest payments for each year to pay off the debts, or would you rather suggest doing a CD at first to try and aid you in that? that makes sense? It does, it does, it does. So um, what, what he's trying to describe is, um, well, I can invest, and I can use the return on those investments to slowly pay off on my debt or increase the payment towards my debt. Use what the money I'm making in the market versus that. So, and, and it's a good point. So why does stocks, 
they are risky. Um, so it says right here, stocks gain 10% per year, but we all know stocks don't guarantee 10% every single year. So some years they're gonna be down, some years gonna be up. But paying off your debt, like I said, is usually a guaranteed 6% return on your money. So if, you're, if your goal is to, at the end of your life, to have the maximum amount of wealth, paying off your debt is, is, is a, a better option. And it's less risky and it's guaranteed. Go with what is known, will always take you further. Um, everybody says, oh, I'm going to throw it in the market, I'm going to get 100% return. That rarely happens. Um, and trust me, once you pay off all your debt, you will throw so much money in the market that you, you can have all the fun if you want to. You do derivatives trading, anything your heart's desire. All right? Does that answer the question? Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yes. I don't think I really, like, agree with you on paying off all your debt. Mm -hmm. But I have, like, a different philosophy. Yes. But, uh... Like, oh, student loan debt. Now, debt, like credit card debt and all that, I agree paying that off. The student loan debt, uh, there we go. Now, let me I, answer, I don't really have a question. Let me answer, you, answer that question. So, so student, there, there's different, I, I invite it, it's actually a really good question. Student loan debt, people think, well, I, I incurred that debt um, for a good reason. It was for a good cause, right? I'm getting my education, I'm smarter, I can earn more out there um, in the market. But there's, there's no real free lunch. And, and, and let me explain student loan debt, which most of you know. Student loan debt is actually the riskiest type of debt that you can ever incur. Why? All other debts, credit card debts, your mortgage, um, any type of liabilities, you can bankrupt out of. Student loan debt lasts forever. And nowadays, people are incurring, you know, the 65, the 100K, the 120K if you want to get your MBA at a prestigious institution. That is going to be with you forever. Um, so the question is, why would you have that level of toxic debt in, in your um, portfolio, really, which is considered your assets and your liabilities? It's too, it's too much, but you can take care of it. And I think you, so I have, so I'm, I'm, I'm turning 29 later this week. I have 30 year olds, people who've been out of college for years, and they still have sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 worth of student loan debt after they graduate. How, do, how does that affect um, family creation? How does that affect the risk you can do? How does that affect what you can pass down to your heirs? So it, it's not just what I can consume now. It's more of what do I want to pass down? What's going to be in my legacy? What type of risk can or can't I take in life? And that's that fulfillment, because trust me, if you keep that pet of an $80,000 um, student loan debt, it's, you're going to put it in the back of your mind, but it's still right here. It's still heavy. And, and those of us who've graduated with student loan debt, we know the feeling. And, and, and the problem is we, we probably need to do a better job communicating that to the, to the younger generation. Any other questions? You said like toxic debt, but is there is there really a question between neutral and toxic, or is there also a positive aspect to that? So debt, he's talking. What are the positive aspects of debt? So a lot of companies use that, right? So the question is, if the companies use it, why should not be using it? It makes complete sense. Um, debt and for a corporation, um, interest can be deducted. Um, just like a mortgage, that interest can be deducted. So that's why they mostly use debt. When you use debt, you leverage your situation. You actually increase the risk that you're taking. And that puts you in this area around here. So if I leverage this stock position, and let's say I borrow $20,000 and purchase some stock, that actually curves my return because I have to take care of those interest payments. Okay? So if you're, if you're you know, Miss Risque, Big Daddy Fast Hands, which there's nothing wrong with being any of those people, right? Some people, that leverage makes sense. But I think if we really look at what we want at the end of the day, um, I don't think playing at the craps tables, which is what a leverage position is, would be in your best interest. And, and, and that's the problem, and that's why I wanted to do this lecture, because individuals are not taught this aspect. They're taught to save, but they don't think of themselves themselves as a company and a, and a return that they want to require out of their lives. And, re, and it really goes back down to loving yourself, but that it's the knowledge aspect that we're missing. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Yes, on the topic of 
like retirement and you had mentioned a 401k is with big corporations. Is it better to, do you get more value if you go to an outside party like a financial advisor and sort of start your retirement fund that way or is it generally known to be better to do something like a Fortune 500 business? So, um, it all depends on the circumstances that you are in. So, I'm not against completely against working for a large corporation to get that experience. So let's say you find yourself after graduating, and congratulations, you did a good job, uh, and you work for a lay major corporation, they offer you a 401k with a match. Take the match. You know, you're in that circumstances, maximize your situation. But first, think about, think about what your goal is and your return, and that match will, it'll pop out and, and it'll be automatically guaranteed. Now there's some tax things that you can do. So, in most cases, you're gonna, if you work for a major corporation, you spend time there, you are gonna go into their 401k system. But I, and this is a little bit side topic, I'm kinda in, torn between that. So let's think about this. If I'm investing in a 401k, I'm invest, giving my money that I have earned to somebody who does not necessarily have my value system. So they may you know, buy a company stock, and we're just gonna use this as an example, it doesn't mean that they are, like Walmart, who I don't agree with their employee practices. So really think of every dollar you spend as that. But if yes, if you're in a corporation, utilize their 401k plan to maximize your wealth. But understand what they're doing. They're actually, they're doing that to control you. The, the system, the scrambling system was not say don't participate. It really meant understand where you are and maximize, because with knowledge of what they're doing, you can kind of right size where you want to be in life. Yes, sir. I got a question. So, like, when you transfer from like job to job, I know there's something called like rollover. Mm -hmm. Like, how does that work? Can you use some information about rollover? No problem. So, when you go into a corporation, um, you sign up for their 401k, man. You do matches over so often. Uh, you're going to accumulate so, so much amount of wealth. But, you know, you guys are young gunners, you want to make the most out of your money, so you find a new opportunity and a new job. So you take on that new job, but the problem is your 401k is still left in that employer. Is that a good or a bad thing? It really depends on you if you want to leave it there or not. For me, I like to see things in one screen, and I'm, I'm kind of emotionally attached, like I don't want somebody I left <laughs> having my money. But I've heard financial experts say leave it there, so there's nothing wrong. So to address your question, what is a rollover? A rollover is when you take that old employer's 401k dollars and actually roll that over into an external 401k manager, so whether that be a Vanguard or Fidelity. And it's a fairly simple process. You call Vanguard and Fidelity and say, I have a 401k with this company, it's this account number, and usually they'll take care of most of that for you because they want your money. Um, and usually the old employer will be more than happy to pass that money, money over because they have to keep actually track of you. So if you pass away or something, or if they change it, they have to find you out. So that's what an IRA rollover It basically means I'm taking my employer's 401k plan and rolling it over into a third party or an alternate party 401k provider. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm a finance major, so this is really interesting. Yeah, it's, um, cool. it's good stuff. So, okay, so my question is kind of is for you personally. So, like, when you decided that you wanted to go and start your own business, how did you invest wisely so that when you were going through, like, the foundational part and stuff like that, that you were able to live comfortably? Yeah, so, um, and it, it actually circles back with um, the question the young lady asked in front about the 60K debt. When I graduated, like, to that pop the car, okay? So, at, when I graduated and walked out of college, and um, I was in a pretty good situation. I, my first job was at George Pacific, and I was an internal auditor. And I, and I got the job before I graduated. So I was making a decent amount of money before I even graduated. So of course I got the car. Uh, so at the end of it, I had around $47,000 of student loan debt, which doesn't sound like a lot to you guys, but back in that time, that was still a good bit of money. And I was riding in the car, and I listened to somebody called Dave Ramsey, if you guys are familiar with him. He's a big non-debt guy. And he kind of broke down into different Element. So if you guys are taking notes, Total Money Makeover um, is a book that I highly recommend you read. And I realized that I couldn't be where I wanted to be 
if I stretched out that period, that long period for 10 years. I couldn't invest what I wanted to do. I, I'm a finance major, so all I wanted to do was invest all my money. So after I paid off all my student loan debt, the next recommendation after your um, you know, war chest is to save up a couple years worth of living expenses. Basically, that puts it in your back pocket. So if your car breaks down, you need a new car, you can slap the money down and never have to worry about debt. But I slowly started to accumulate assets, and I realized if I work for a company, by the time I retire, I might have about $2 million, okay? And that, that may sound like a lot, but you know, I'm, I'm an ambitious person. I graduated from Georgia State. Y'all graduated from Emory. Y'all want to you know, be a big deal. I wanted to see what really I could do. Could I make an actual corporation worth multiple millions of dollars, tens of millions, I mean, potentially a billion? And another factor was I looked at my family and my friends and I understood that they weren't managing their money correctly. They weren't getting this lecture that you guys are getting at this age. Um, and like I told them um, in, in the back couple seconds ago, if our people are <laughs> if our people are not benefiting and we have a whole sector of the world called financial services, that means the financial services sector actually failed them by definition, right? They're supposed to serve them financially, but we are being, you know, it's not balanced our benefits in this world. So I wanted to start a company, take, take on the high risk, give back my value system, and that's why I decided to start my own wealth management firm. And yes, it's slow, it takes time to grow, but it's been the most rewarding thing, actually helping people put their money in ways to invest. One of the, one of the best things I get to talk to people about is, what are you going to do when you pass down money to your kids? So I have a, I have a pretty well-off um, couple. They have two children. And they're probably going to, you know, when they pass away, give their children about $500,000 each. Okay. So the conversation I had with them was, how are you preparing those kids for that amount of money? Right? $500,000 could kill you if you don't know what to do with it. And after you have splurged it, you will be so depressed the rest of your life. Man, what could I have done? You've seen the lottery ticket people. Let me sit down and talk to you and let's develop a game plan on how we're going to pass down our money. So um, other races, they, they pass down businesses. They pass down know-how, you know, a brewery or something like that. Usually we're passing down financial assets, maybe $100,000, $30,000. How are you preparing your child mentally for those assets and for that being passed down? And sometimes that means make, giving them $20,000 now strategically in educational life and, and of things like that instead of just flopping them down $500,000. Or even worse, you're so disgusted with the way they live life that you, you know, feel like, man, they don't deserve it. I'm just going to throw it out. But they're your kids, right? Think about that now. And that conversation is not happening with our people because the financial services sector is not talking to our people. And trust me, they are getting those conversations. Yes? So I understand your theory and where you're coming from, but like to me, this is highly unrealistic because it, it's based, it seems to me it's based on the assumption that a person lives to nine years of age and be in good health. Which like, I think people like us who go to every go to grad school, we're going to be in like $100,000 debt, and I don't want to spend the majority of my life paying back debt and then not be able to enjoy life itself. So I'm so focused on paying back. So, so the, the, the question goes back to, um, what do you value? Do you, I hear that a lot, and that's a consistent thing. Um, I want to enjoy my life, um, but it goes, but it, it makes you almost forget that that debt isn't there, right? And and that debt is still in the back of your head. It's controlling and dictating certain decisions that you make. So, ignoring it and saying I want to enjoy life, I want to have fun, but if you're not maximizing your wealth. That by default means you're not maximizing sometimes the influence that you can have that money can provide you. Um, and sometimes that would mean short changing um, your end result and your result on your community. So it's all in what you want. Um, I'm not going to, to say don't ever do it, that's bad. I'm giving you another way of thinking about life than what society has been giving you. And it might, I'm not going to lie, it's challenging nowadays. It, let's say you want to become a doctor or something. But think about it this way. Make sure the degree that you choose is going to provide you an adequate return. And, and, and I know this, may, this lecture may come a little late, probably should have this in high school. Um, but make sure what you decide to go into is worth the money that it costs you. 
And, you know, yeah, um, I know that's not a happy ending. <laughs> but that, that's the honest truth, and sometimes you have to give that. I've seen people who work their whole life to pay back their debt and then die at the age of 25 and they don't do anything they want to do. Because they were so focused and keep on paying off all their debt, especially their student debt. And that's the risk you take. I mean, there's no, as you see on the, on the x-axis, there's always going to be risk. The point is, they try to pay off that debt so when they were done, they can really live life. They can really take on risk. They can really um, be free. And that's what they thought in their head, and that's willing that chance. Now, for some people, that might not be worth it to. I'm only young one time, all those other things. But I think if you stay focused, and you really think about how, how I can take care of this, stuff will kind of work itself out and move out the way and, and stuff will come in to take care of that. Something about, I'm gonna call it what it is. Sometimes, sometimes doing, being focused and um, doing something for, for the right reasons, things move in your favor. Any other questions? It's a classroom, this is what we do. Kind of, okay, it's, it's a little complicated, but so you know how like in high school sometimes you're taught that if you save up X amount a month in like a bond or a money market, then you can make like a million dollars by age this. But my question to you is like with floating interest rates happening all the time and depending on like the type of bond and like the type of company if it to fall, like how realistic truly is that ideal that like, oh, if you save up, $30 every two weeks in this account, and all of a sudden you'll be a millionaire. So, um, a lot of those things are, 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 are realistically, they, when they talk about those things, they don't talk about the best in the individual bonds. So, um, General Electric, you buy one of their bonds, whatever, tornado hits them, they go bankrupt, you lose all your money, right? That, that's what you're referring to. Usually they talk about bond funds, which is a, 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 a like a mutual fund where they buy a group of bonds. So. In that bond fund, some are going to default and, and go down. But overall, those the after returns year after year, it's going to continue to go up. So if you buy an individual bond, yes, you're taking that risk. But it's not as risky as owning a stock. I hope that helped. Gotcha, yes. and, and stocks are the same way. An individual stock can go bankrupt. But if you have own a group of stocks, and this is called diversification, those are in finance, that means not put all your eggs in one basket. That's the mentality of that. Gotcha. All right. Anything else? Yeah, the business card. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anything about finance? I kind of studied it my whole life. How much money I'm going to need when I retire? Well, 40. Well, actually, 15. I guess for the standard person, like 35. Yeah. So it needs a way to do this. That's actually a good question. Um, think about, so how much money I need to retire ultimately depends on how much the quality of life I want to live on in my golden years. So how, what is my quality of my life when I retire? Do I want to travel every year? Um, do I want to give like crazy? Um, how, what does those golden years actually look like? Okay, What you're going to do is take that amount that you need to live on per year. Okay, I write this down. Divide that number by 3%. So if you want to live on $80,000 per year, divide that number by 3%, and that is the money you have to accumulate to live on that income. Why is that relevant? 3% in most cases, you can probably you know, get a return just buying a safe bond or putting it even in US Treasuries. It's the return you can make plus inflation. So usually the target inflation rate is about 2%. So that's why that 3% number is. Take the amount you want to live on on a yearly basis, divide that number by three. Anybody have a calculator? This is what we do here. Okay, somebody give me a number they want to live off when they're retired. Okay, $80,000. Everybody divide $80,000 by 3%. Make sure you sign 
And if your parents and stuff need this advice, please. <laughs> $80,000 per year, how much do you need to accumulate is $2 million plus. Very simple equation. Equation that they should have taught you in high school, but it's simple math. So you said uh, how much you want to live, I mean, how much you make a year, or how much you want to live off a year, divided by 3? Divided by 3%, that's 0, 0,3. How many years is that? It doesn't matter. So why three percent? Let's um, um why three why why um let's think about let's, let's call it how other people manage their money. Everybody heard what a trust fund is. Okay, trust fund is what the rich people put their money in and families live off year after year after year. The money never goes away. Emory has a foundation, they they use the same model. They say, I need to spend 1% per year. Our family trust fund says, I want to spend 2% per year. These percentages is they know that their income will sustain inflation adjusted because they make a certain amount, okay? So that's why people with money have money for the rest of their lives. Off this simple equation, they know that if all I need is this to live on, I can easily get 3%. They usually make more than 3%. Why? That's just a really conservative basis. Any other questions? Okay, I got, I'm sorry, I got Next one. question you're on charge. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you mentioned earlier that basically the financial services industry is failing our people, which I completely agree with. And I feel like, in my opinion, one of those reasons is because I feel like we're not as we don't know as much about like the derivatives and stuff like that, you know, kind of like the trading elements and the stock options and like all of those other markets. Mm -hmm. So what would you say would be like, what's the best way to sort of educate our people on that so that they can invest their money in the wisest manner? Okay. Yeah, just to do a full circle of question, like I said earlier, you know, people want companies you know, their children are playing in the factory, right? They're playing games, and so they're learning about all those little things and how that company actually works. Um, you know, of course, I'm a student of my craft, so I read a lot of books on financial planning and all that stuff. And one of the things the guy said, when, when he's in a meeting with an affluent family with these trust funds, it doesn't matter if this individual is punked out with the mohawk, or they're just found starting a family, or, or even if they're a teenager. When he comes in and presents a stock idea, Everybody in that family is asking them questions like they've been a finance major their whole entire lives. So what is the thing that they have to do? You have to literally change the conversation. No more housewives, no more empire. When we talk about things that we value and that are passionate us, we need to talk about stocks, bonds, portfolios. It's in the conversation to the age they were um, you know, five years old. Anybody see the movie Richie Rich? And he, at the beginning, he said, my dad likes fun, so I like them too. When do, our, when do we film our kids on social media with those things? So that, that, that's the first part of the question. Like, well, how do we learn? Well, unfortunately, they want to hide it from them, and guess where they put it? We have to, we have to be willing to turn the pages. And, and, and those of us who are parents, those of us who are leaders in positions of society, we have to, to talk about it, not be shy about it. And really, and really drive all of us into greater wealth. I hope that answers. And, and, and derivatives and trade thing. Derivatives is more of a speculative instrument, and usually it's only worthwhile unless you move big money, millions of dollars. Oh yeah, that's fair. So, just on that. What's your expertise on uh, currency market? Currency market. So let's define what currency. Is. Yeah, currency market is so. Which, you know, it's funny how very few people know that exists. So a currency market is, you know, you have different countries have different currencies and different currencies on like the euro multiple currencies. The currency market is actually when banks 
swap currencies with each, with, each, with each other. So if you as an individual are going on vacation, you may need some euros to make your purchases, all those different things. When major corporations buy a, a factory, well, they're going to exchange a couple more euros. So we need people to exchange those money. Now, currency exchange, you need to have an intermediary to swap those dollars, OK? And the bank gets a little money from that. So he's talking about. And, and they developed a market similar to the stock market. So when people are doing currency exchanges, what they're doing is they're, they're saying, I have $500,000 in euros coming in because I sold some tennis shoes to, to Europe. So I have $500,000 in euros coming in. So to hedge my bets, I would go into the currency market, derivatives market, and make sure that there's no fluctuations because currencies move. So if a company, a, 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 a um, country like Russia does something we don't like, we pass sanctions on. Well, they're, they're um, is it ruble? Yeah. The Russian currency isn't, as, isn't worth as much anymore. So currencies fluctuate, and there's a market that tracks that. And the point of that currency market is to find price discovery, which is what, how many dollars is going to give me so many yen or yen? Okay. How many dollars are going to give me so many rubles? How many dollars are going to give me so many euros? And there's currency against each different type of major currency in the world. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you explain the intersection between the uh, financial capital and the human capital? Yeah. It, 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 it doesn't represent anything, but if you want to get super technical, it's, it represents the point where my money working harder than me. Internalize that for a second. At some point in time, hopefully, in your time, your money is going to work. A lot of times it doesn't happen, to be honest with you. Uh, but your money will start producing more money than you. Think about that. Like, and you know, financial markets don't sleep. You're earning interest all day long. While you're sleeping, you're making money. Um, a lot of us, in black folks, we don't we don't trust the financial markets for good reasons. Our life experiences, institutions um, have done us wrong. My granddad tells me stories on how, you know, to get a mortgage, he you know, pretty much had to be gypped uh, on the rate that he had. So there's a lot, strong distrust with financial um, um, industries. So we don't invest. But think about your work, money working for you. That rich family, they're meeting on their money working for them. Um, and like the young lady said, it, it seems unrealistic to, to forsake all those things. But somebody has to take loss. Okay. Somebody has to roll up their sleeves and take a L. Hopefully, you know, my company, I can pass down to my family. I have my little brother. Hopefully, he gets his law degree. He'll work for my company. It doesn't have to go with some of the headache that I had to go through. But I took the loss for that. So the question is, which one of you guys are going to be willing to take a loss for your family? Any other questions? All right. Well, I enjoyed speaking to you. It was fun. It's nice to have finance major and business majors in the room. You guys make it interesting. I hope you enjoyed it. hope you learned a lot. And hopefully you can use some of these tools um, in the future. And don't hold this to yourself. Spread the knowledge, talk to your friends, talk to your family members. You need an amen, give me a call, you have my card. i uh, hopefully be able to reach out to each and one of you via email. All right? Well, thank you, and I hope you guys will invite me back again.